My uh, strategy today, what I hope to achieve, at the least, today, is to convince you or show you, or at least get you worried, that certain philosophical problems, certain philosophical issues, that look very different on the surface, and that people treat as very different problems, are actually very similar, if not the same. That's my goal for today. My goal on Friday, the next class, will be to try to show you that certain problems that look very similar, maybe the same problem, are actually in certain ways very different. So uh, the two classes, um, in a way, will go together to form one extended um, brief. So I'm sorry if we have to stop in the middle today. What I want to try to do today is show you in a little more detail. We started talking about this last class, is to try to show you in a little more detail that certain problems can share a form, that you can have philosophical problems that are apparently about a very different subject matter, a very different content, or come from a very different area of philosophy, but the form of the problem is the same. And if one really sees how similar the form of the problem is, then one starts to see that if the solution of this form didn't work there, it's not going to work here either for the same reason. Also, if one comes to be able to recognize certain philosophical problems as having the same form, you can save yourself a lot of time in philosophy, because all that work you did over there turns out to be work that um, has a bearing. What we're going to do next time is to look at philosophical issues on the same topic, on the same content where people keep talking along, and show how at a certain point the form of the problem has started to change. It's no guarantee that you have the same problem. You've called it the same thing. Say, skepticism about meaning or something. The fact that you have some label that everyone's using that's supposed to guarantee the sharedness of topic doesn't mean that the problem won't change a lot if the form and the discussion starts to change. So. So today we're going to try to, as it were, keep a form fixed and vary the content a bit. Next class, we'll start to vary the form and over cases where the content is common. Um, so that's what we're just going to do for these first two classes as a way of opening out into the much larger topics of the course. Now, the kind of skepticism I'm going to be talking about today, and I just want us to focus on today, I'm going to call it Cartesian skepticism. One thing we could talk about, and someday should talk about, perhaps, is why I call it Cartesian skepticism. Why this label? Why Cartesian? Most of the philosophical problems we'll be talking about today, Descartes never talked about. So why call this Cartesian skepticism? I think that's a good question. I'd be happy to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it today. So. If the label Cartesian skepticism bothers you, then think of it as the skepticism that we talked about in the class meeting on September 24th, or whatever other label for picking out this kind. As long as you're convinced there's a kind of skepticism that we're looking at across these examples, that's all I need for today. Once we're familiar with the kind and we have it under control, we really understand what we're talking about, then I would be glad to discuss why I think there's a point to giving this historical label to this kind. But let's make sure we know what we're talking about first. Otherwise, in my experience, the discussion doesn't go very well because the topic isn't really shared. Those of you who have uh, started reading the article by me assigned for today also will notice in the first part of that article I discussed something called, I call in that article, Kantian skepticism. I also propose we don't talk about that today. Next class, we can bring that onto the discussion. I'm not trying to avoid either of these topics. I just want us to proceed in, in a way where we're really uh, making progress. So if you have questions, if you're interested in that, as of Friday class, please feel free to ask questions. Let's just get on top of uh, Cartesian skepticism. So the strategy I want today is to look at something which I want to pick out as a distinctive kind of skepticism, historically very influential, especially starting in a... 16th and 17th centuries, increasingly less influential, I think, also 
These are two interesting questions we also won't discuss today, but I'll just mention them. Why, at a certain point, did this kind of skepticism become urgent in the history of philosophy? I think it's a mistake to read it all the way back to the beginning of philosophy. And why is it becoming less urgent? Or giving way to other things called skepticism without their always being distinguished as different varieties. These are, I think, all good questions, but they're only questions you can ask once you have the phenomena distinguished. So, again, we'll postpone those questions until we distinguish them. But this sort of skepticism we're discussing today, which I will call Cartesian, I want to look at five examples of it. One from the philosophy of, from the area of philosophy called epistemology, but more narrowly from the philosophy of perception since there are other examples one could take with epistemology. One from the area of philosophy you might call philosophy of mind, but again, more specifically, what's called skepticism about other minds. I think there are other cases one could take from philosophy of mind. One could even wonder whether some of these other cases aren't partly examples of philosophy of mind. Part of what one starts to see here is these areas of philosophy. Areas of philosophy are not so distinct, but there's even a danger of dividing philosophy into areas um, when one's thinking about these issues. So, philosophy of perception, and there we'll look specifically at the, so today, at the problem of the so-called skepticism about the external world. Here we'll look at skepticism about other minds. Then a case from philosophy of language. Again, there's more than one kind of issue one could look at here, but the one I want to focus on here is a kind of skepticism about one's knowledge of meaning, one's knowledge of what someone means by their words. A kind of case from philosophy of action, the kind of case I want to focus on here has to do with how one knows that an action is intentional, somebody intended it, that it was the kind of thing that could be intended. And finally, a kind of case from aesthetics, where the question is how one knows something is a work of art. Notice, um, in each one of these cases, I said, how one knows. So that's one of the marks of what I'm calling Cartesian skepticism, is it always concerns one's entitlement to a claim to knowledge. And the structure of Cartesian skepticism is that the claim to knowledge is always placed under suspicion, a doubt, a ground for doubt is entered. And if the ground for doubt is entered the right way, and one of the things we started talking about last time, we'll talk about more, is what is the right way? <laughs> but if you can enter the ground for doubt the right way, you don't just take out the initial candidate example of knowledge. It looks like you threaten the whole category of knowledge. Last time I talked about the example of my seeing a bird at 50 feet just before it flies away. I pointed out, if I turned out to be wrong about that, the conclusion would be, Professor Conan was wrong. Well, Professor Conan can't tell blue jays. Or Professor Conan has bad eyesight. Or Professor Conan doesn't know anything about Norwegian birds. But the conclusion would be like that. That is, its consequences would be extremely local. It wouldn't distrust your knowledge of birds or your eyesight, let alone sensory knowledge as such. Um, so you have to choose the example the right way. But if you choose the example the right way, and you choose the ground for doubt the right way, then you raise a certain kind of skepticism about knowledge. I want to look at a few cases of that. And the reason I'm putting this this carefully is because for each of these areas, and in fact, this is part of the source of confusion philosophy, for each of these labels, skepticism about external world, skepticism about other minds, especially skepticism about meaning, and so forth. There's a rather different kind of a problem you could be worried about that has a different structure. Though people use the same label because they act as if the label naming the topic could pick out the structure of the problem. And I think by the end of next class already we'll see that's not true. It's not just what you're talking about, it's how you're talking about it that gives it its character as a philosophical problem. So what I want to do is just look at these cases and see how we can have problems. And so in a way, the goal here is very minimal today. We're starting very slow. It's a way in which I'm not making any philosophical claims myself. Today, what all we're doing, in a sense, is a certain kind of 
descriptive sociology of philosophy. <laughs> and we just look at problems that people have talked about, some of them, and see how you can have homology of structure across extremely different philosophical topics with respect to this particular structure. That's all we're going to try to see today. But even just seeing that clearly, I think, is useful because it involves learning to see past, as it were, the clothing of the problem to the real body of it. Um, uh, one other thing um, is that I think I'll focus. If we really try to talk about all five of these topics in the limited time available to us, I think there's a danger that we won't really get anywhere. So I'm going to I'm going to sort of um, weight these topics in this order too. We'll get the perception case the clearest. We'll spend the most time on it. It's the classic form of the skeptical problem in almost every area. Historically, it's always the one that comes first, which I think is interesting. And then the mind case, the language case, these two cases will spend increasingly less time on. We'll just see how the time allows, but, but at least that you have some flavor. I want to be clear also that I could have chosen other top areas of philosophy. Yet. I'm not saying something like, here are the five areas in which you can find this problem. In fact, I'm more inclined to saying something like the opposite. You give me an area of philosophy and I will show you a version. <laughs> of this problem. And the same thing for the rather different form of skepticism we'll talk about on Friday, again. So, two versions of skepticism, that area of philosophy, or at least two versions, because there are areas of philosophy called things like philosophy of science, but that doesn't name a particular problem. It names all kinds of philosophical problems that can come up that have something to do with science. So, in fact, many cases. But you will see in the next few weeks as the course goes on that I do have strategic reasons for choosing these five areas. Seeing the similarities and differences across these particular areas I think is a very particular way of giving a certain kind of perspicuous overview. So I do have, um, I do have my ulterior motives in these choices. I, don't, I won't deny that, but they can emerge as we go along. But they, but they are in some sense optional choices. Good. So now let's get down to work. Perception, Cartesian skepticism and perception. Here's the one case where Descartes' text is actually a useful source. He discusses this one, Descartes does. So, if I'm a Cartesian skeptic, first I take an example, what I'll call a best case of knowledge. This phrase, best case of knowledge, um, let me just say, I'm taking this phrase from the reading from Stanley Cavell. You start reading that, you'll start seeing that I'm actually alluding to a certain discussion of skepticism there. If you're a Cartesian, you want to start with the best case of knowledge. If it's philosophy of perception, you want to start with the best case of perceptual knowledge. Not a goldfinch 50 feet in a rainy day in Norway if you're an American who's just arrived. <laughs> but something like, you know, classically things like a fireplace, a hand, an envelope a chair. Or, to take an example we can share right now, that Professor Conan is standing in front of a class. So, I am standing in front of a class. The conditions appear to be perfectly optimal. The lighting appears to be fine. I myself, as far as I know, am in perfectly good framework for making epistemic, um, condition for making epistemic judgments. I got a fair amount of sleep. I did get kind of wet getting over here, but I'm kind of dry. My eyes are dry. I can get real close. You can see that Dixon's not made out of cardboard. Just looks like a really good case for knowledge. It doesn't seem to be, in terms of the normal ways in which one could epistemically um, exculpate a failure to make a claim of knowledge. Well, I should have looked more closely. It doesn't look very plausible if I turn out to be wrong about my being in a class right now. That the, my excuse will be, I should have looked more closely. Um, so, best case of knowledge, that's the kind of example you choose you know, in perception. Perceptual knowledge, my basis for claiming I'm in a class right now. If you ask me, how do you know you're in a class right now? Then I'm going to say something like, because I can see. Yeah, and I can see that I'm in a class. That looks like the form of the answer, if I have to give an answer. That's when skepticism comes, it's, has a possibility of starting, the kind of thing we're interested in, Cartesian skepticism, when the answer has that kind of generality. 
in the case of perceptual knowledge, because I can see it. If you ask me, how do I know it's a goldfinch at 50 feet away? I say, well, because they have red heads. If that's my ground for knowledge, then um, already we can't get skepticism going. If you point out that gold crests have red heads as well as goldfinches, the conclusion is going to be, well, I guess he doesn't know. No skepticism. If, 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 if the ground for knowledge itself is secured at the level of marks of features of that kind of individuated sort. So the skeptic needs to construct the example in such a way that the person who makes the claim is going to give the right kind of ground. So if that ground collapses, there's trouble. In the case of perceptual knowledge, we want the ground to be something like, because I can see it, because I can hear it. Then, the skeptic needs to cause trouble for this ground. I say, best case, I'll give you a best case of knowledge. From G. Moore, I walk right into the skeptic's trap, and I say, here is a hand. Or, um, um, I'm in front of a class. There's a case of knowledge, for sure. The skeptic says, how do you know? I say, because well, I can see I'm in front of a class. Now, what does the Cartesian skeptic do? What does he say next? He, does he say, oh, you're right, you can see it, sorry. You must know it. Well, uh, because I can see it, shut up the Cartesian skeptic. What's he going to do next? Fix it next. Maybe I'll show you that your eyes are not uh, deceiving you. I'll show you that. Your eyes are not uh, deceiving my, you. My eyes. Because of my eyesight? Maybe, maybe dreaming or something. Right. See? Good. Dreaming, I think, is a, the way Descartes goes. It's worth noticing the difference. If it's something wrong with my eyesight, it just turns out to be, look, Jim, or Professor Conant, you know that you have trouble with these new prescription glasses. And in fact, I do. I just got them. They're bifocals. Um, um, then the conclusion is going to be, I should get new glasses. No skepticism. So, yet, so it's very important that the ground for doubt doesn't seem to go through the wrong level of particularity about me, say. But if he says, dreaming, now we've got something going, but why does dreaming matter? What is the structure of the argument from dreaming? How does dreaming cause trouble for my claim? Yes? But actually, uh, we passed some, somehow through the last uh, class with other, so other examples than the dreaming metaphor. Many. Um, I mean, the classic one is, um, I think the dreaming one works particularly well. But let's see how the dreaming one works, and then look at some other examples. Um, but yeah, I think there are lots of ways to do it. Um, but the crucial thing you need is just what you said. That's what the other examples have to do is the thing that you just said, the dreaming example does. That is, they have to allow the skeptic to be able to say, here's a case that would be indistinguishable, sensorily or sensuously indistinguishable from the case you're now in. But if you're in that other situation, then you wouldn't be standing in front of a class. And since you cannot now distinguish your present case from that case, you might be in the situation you say, but you don't know that you're standing from class. Because you're only in a position to know that you're standing from class if you can exclude that possibility. So he brings up not just a possibility. There's much confusion about this, I think, in the literature about skepticism. What the skeptic does is not something so cheap as to just bring up a bizarre possibility. Um, and then you can say, well, and so some of the literature is in blocking skepticism about how bizarre possibilities should be excluded. But the skeptic's strategy is not just to bring up a bizarre possibility. Um, his possibilities often are bizarre, but that's not, as it were, the crucial thing about them. Um, the more plausible, the better. But the, you know, But the crucial thing about them is what you said, which is he brings up a scenario such that 
If you were in that scenario, rather than the one you claim to be in, you, from your present position, could not tell the difference. Um, so, um, in the case of dreaming, the way this works is Descartes will say, I have often dreamed, and my dreams have been very, very convincing. And then I woke up to discover that I wasn't in the situation I'm in. So I might right now be dreaming that I am in front of a classroom. And if I were to wake up a moment from now, I would discover that I was wrong, that I wasn't in front of a classroom. So, in a sense, the crucial phrase in the Descartes quotation here, as I said, it depends on your translation, is when Descartes says, there are no marks or features by which we can distinguish dreaming from waking states. The skeptic is always interested in creating, the Cartesian skeptic, excuse me, is always, let's just say for today, when I say the skeptic, I mean the Cartesian skeptic. You'll find out next week, I think that's not all the skeptic means. But just for today, the skeptic means the Cartesian skeptic. So, um, so when the, the Cartesian skeptic is always trying to create a situation in which there's reality and illusion. But the pair, the real case, the veridical case and the illusory case, are constructed in such a way that there are no marks or features that pick out the real case. So, the structure is going to be, if right now I am dreaming, and then it's very tempting to say something like this. Let me, you don't usually say it, but let's make it explicit. The, the thought is something like, from within, from within, I cannot tell. So the idea is, I'm inside my experience. There's an inside and an outside. And the external world is outside my experience. And then if you make the assumptions even more explicit, what we see is that the structure of the argument is my experience, the thing I have from within, standing in front of a classroom, could itself have the same character regardless of what's going on in the outside. Usually... When I have an experience of this character of being in front of the classroom, what's going on, on the outside, inside and outside are in quotes here. Nobody actually says this. I'm trying to bring out a picture. Or maybe they say this, but they don't have to say it. They don't usually say it. But what's going on in the outside corresponds to what's going on inside. But it could be completely different. And what was going on in the inside would be the same. So there is an idea of the experience is mediating the knowledge. The thing I want to know is beyond the reach of the experience. Then I need to make a conclusion. So you always have the idea in Cartesian skepticism, we'll see this in other cases, of it looking like I need to make an inference. An inference, in this case, from my sensory experience to how things are. The inference I want to make is when things appear in the best case, or Descartes says, when I have clear and distinct ideas, when the best case, when things appear to me thus and so, then I can conclude they are thus and so. The structure is always one where it looks like I need an inference from a certain situation, here the sensory experience, to the conclusion, whether things are as the experience represents them. And then the Cartesian always blocks the inference by showing you that you could have a case just like the case you're in, as far as you can tell on the inside, but the conclusion doesn't follow. So we had two hands, and yeah, Michael, and then. Yes. Okay, I was thinking about this a lot yesterday, and um, uh -oh. I think you can problematize uh, this card's argument uh, very easily. You can what? Make it more complex. More, uh, you can problematize it, uh, make it a problem, because uh, it, it first, at first uh, side it looks uh, that it's breaking totally with common sense. By, by being uh, or have doubt in, 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 by having doubt over everything, but at least in Descartes' argument, he is distinguishing between reality and dream, 
and he 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 he, he wants to uh, he gives the impression to to know that a dream is less real than reality. So how can you know that? Well, well the, 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 uh, I think you said a lot very fast there. But let me just clarify a few things. First of all, what I'm trying to do in today's class is I'm not trying to defend Descartes or criticize him or actually defend or criticize any of these other forms of skepticism. All I want us to do today is see that there are some forms of skepticism, whether you like them or not, whether you want to hold your nose as you listen to them or not, <laughs> and just notice the similarity in structure. I think there's something to be gained. So that's all we're doing. We are going to, in a few classes, start to criticize these forms of skepticism. But I want us to understand what we're criticizing before we criticize. So I really meant today we're, and next class, our goal is description. Then we can start in criticism. But, um, but let me also just say a couple other things to what you said. In this kind of skepticism, you're not doubting everything. It's very important. There's a lot you're not doubting. This is sort of, in a sense, the point of Descartes' cogito. In particular, you're not doubting your knowledge of how things appear to you. If I'm a Cartesian skeptic about perception, and you ask me, do you know that it appears to you? Slightly what strange way of speaking, but let me have it. Do you know that it appears to you that you're in a class? Yes, I do. That I cannot doubt. So, it's part of the strategy of Cartesian skepticism, in each of these cases we'll see, to divide things into the category of the dubitable and the indubitable. One of the things you're doing is doubting, and you're always finding there's some things you can't doubt. And then it looks like what you need to do is infer from the stuff you can't doubt to the thing you really wanted. In this case, we cannot doubt that things appear to us a certain way. But the thing we really want, it looks like, if we're doing philosophy of perception, is not knowledge of how things appear to us, but how knowledge of how things are. And then the problem he shows us, or wants to show us, this kind of skeptic, is we don't have a surefire inference from the one to the other. So you're absolutely right, you're not doubting everything. Um, now, that distinction between no problem at all about how things appear to me, Big problem about how things are beyond the appearances. That feature of this kind of skepticism, we'll see, is not at all the way things work with the kind of skepticism we'll talk about on Friday. Um, that itself is a crucial feature of Cartesian skepticism. Another way of putting this is to say that in Cartesian skepticism, in any form of Cartesian skepticism, you always have a gap. And, and, and if I had to give you one feature of Cartesian skepticism to look for, if you want to look and see if it's Cartesian skepticism, I would say, look for the gap. <laughs> and there's always a gap. Here the gap is from the inside of my mind to the world. I'm on the mind side. I want to get to the world side. I can't doubt. The things that are on my side of the gap in Cartesian skepticism are always taken to be completely unproblematic if you will, in this case, the mental stuff. And then, the stuff on the far side of the gap, in this case, the worldly stuff, if you want, the physical stuff, is problematic. But that's always the structure. Cartesian skepticism is not, in a certain sense, radical. If what you think it means to be radical is to doubt everything you could doubt. In that sense, Cartesian skeptics are not radical. They're always saying, oh, there's a lot you can't doubt. The problem is, you can't get from there to this place you wanted to go. I mention this because people often think the point of Cartesian skepticism is the doubt is so radical. Well, compared to what? Radical is relative. Compared to someone who doesn't doubt, it's radical. Compared to other kinds of skepticism, Cartesian skepticism is very structured, depends upon there being two sides of a gap, no problem on the near side. Big problem about the far side. That's the structure of it. Um, but we will say much more about this issue that you raised, Mihail, about um, is there a problem about assuming that we know what we dream? That, that, that problem will come back. But that problem is not itself a problem that the Cartesian skeptic himself sees as a problem. So I don't want to talk about it today. Because today I just want to describe what different Cartesian skeptics think. Once we have that under control, we can turn around and think about what we think about what they think. <laughs> you talk about uh, Marx 
future. But uh, but why can't this smart be tough? It's like the talk only smarts that you you can distinguish uh, dreams and uh, if you wait long enough. Yeah, because it seems that it doesn't account the time can be one of these smarts. Well, the, um, again, <coughs> j just to flag something, I I'll say something that, and just not to be rude, but again, are not. Tr if we want to say, is there a problem with this kind of skepticism? If you want to know my view, the answer is yeah. There's a lot of things we can say criticism. Is. My goal at the moment is not to convince you critique skepticism. It's to give you a bunch of cases of skepticism to see how they're similar. But um, so I do think we can criticize this, but. It's not, if you want to bring time in, you're going to have to do it carefully. If it's just that, because um, otherwise, it's going to look like, okay, um, I'll wait 10 minutes. But I've had dreams that are longer than 10 minutes. Um, and then, um, you know, as soon as we get this kind of thing, if we have a good skeptic, you know, once we get it longer, the skeptic will also point out that memory sometimes deceives us too. So, you know, the more time that goes forward, as we're trying to make sure that no dream was ever that long, you can start wondering, well, do I remember what happened? And have I forgotten that dream? I think it's extremely hard to break this kind of... I mean, if you keep it local enough, you can maybe think you have an answer. But it, as long as you grant the fact that you can construct a case of this sort, um, was there ever a case where you were sure you were right about something? That this had never happened? But then someone said, yes, oh, I was wrong. Um, so so the, the problem is, um, so the, 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 kind of, the kind of argument you'll get into with a skeptic will be one in which you have to be able to say, now, after it takes place for one hour, it's longer than any dream, but shorter than any period during which I haven't misremembered something. And I wonder how, you know, satisfying the answer to skepticism that is. I mean, it's going to start looking like it turns on quantitative features of length of time. Maybe you think one hour is too short and the answer should be one week. No, but it doesn't matter. I mean, as soon as you see that you have an argument that turns on the quantity of the time, it won't be satisfying. So the way you have to bring time in can't just be quantity. Now, having said that, one thing we'll talk about briefly in a few weeks from now is... Kant's critique of Descartes and the refutation of idealism. And that argument has everything to do with time. <laughs> so Kant certainly thinks that by thinking about your ability to order things in time, not how long the dream is, but your ability to order things in time, if you think about that ability carefully, that's going to create problems for Descartes. Could you order things in time without having any relation to things in space? That's the question Kant asks, which in turn is very important for contemporary analytic philosophy and people like Strassen and Evans and so forth. Um, so at that point, you have an argument against a certain kind of conception of the Cartesian inner, in which time plays a crucial role in criticizing Descartes. But we have to think about how we appeal to time. If it's just wait longer, <coughs> That's how time answers. I wonder how convincing that would be. But I think you're right, that time could play a role in the argument. But again, I think we shouldn't get into that now. I think what we should do right now is just look at some kinds of Cartesian skepticism. So, yes? Going back to the phrase priority, yes? I want to just raise something for Cartesian. Yes, thank you. Is it uh, being skeptic about how things appear to us or how things really are? Right. The, the, the Cartesian skeptic is not doubting how things appear at all. In fact, the Cartesian skeptic is taking that to, in some sense, be self-evident, self-intimating. You just open your eyes and you know how things appear. How things are, whether things are as they appear. That's the question of Cartesian skepticism. So, one of the signs is Cartesian skepticism, if you're reading a philosopher, if you want to know what kind of problematic he has. One of the signs that it's a Cartesian problematic is that it's very hard for them to avoid some word like real or really or actual. Those words are usually sort of often, they don't have to be, there are other ways to say it, but those are usually, as it were, the uh, symptoms of a Cartesian problematic, you know. 
Well, I know it appears that we're in a classroom, but how do we know we really are? You know, there's a certain kind of philosophical problem that has the form. That's the Cartesian problem. That's the question. We all can agree, of course. I mean, it's overwhelmingly likely that, you know, we are all right in thinking. I mean, the chances of us all being asleep, but of course you wouldn't actually exist if I'm asleep. Um, so then, you know, the chances of my being wrong about this are very... Um, but that's not the issue. The issue is how do I know this is really the case? And so it's always one, not of appearances or even of probabilities, but how can I exclude with certainty that word certainty is the complement of really here. You often get that word in Cartesian discussions. So it looks like one of the conditions of knowledge is that, you know, I have a certain kind of certainty. That I know my justification isn't pretty good or usually right. But that my justification actually secures the knowledge. So the issue is always one of knowledge. I'll, I'll, I'll summarize that in a moment, yes. Yeah. Right. We haven't said much about it. I was about to say something about that, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah my question is, wouldn't the one say that the Cartesian then was a realist for the discourse he wants to make the skeptical uh, problem for, and that the gap is between the two conditions, so the cardinal of the the method and the truth value distribution of the statements of the relevant discourse? Uh, that's way too fast. I would say something like this. You only get, you know, there's, there, first of all, I think one of the things I'll try to say, maybe after the next class is realism, anti-realism, themselves can name more than one issue. I yeah. think those are words that are exactly as unclear as skepticism. The word skepticism turns out to have varieties, then realism will have varieties too. Um, but the kind of re but there are issues of realism and anti-realism here. One kind of realist will say, yes, there really is a world. So that kind of realist is trying to answer the skeptic by saying, there is a world, and this is how we can know there is. And in fact, in that sense of metaphysical realist, Descartes was held to be a metaphysical realist. He thought, you get God into the conversation in the right sort of way, and you have the right sort of argument about why God must exist, and you have the right sort of argument about why he is benevolent, and must be benevolent, and then we have these clear and distinct ideas, and we realize we can trust those clear and distinct ideas. And therefore, although from within, we can't tell whether our ideas match the world, we know there's a sideways on point of view from which the world and our ideas must match. And we know there's a God who created us so there would be a match so we can rely on them. So an arg it's essentially an argument that from, though from within our design, we can't tell. We can tell and know that we are reliably designed. <laughs> um, so Descartes is a kind of realist and was called a metaphysical realist. That's, in a sense, the classical kind of realism. What people mean by realism in 20th century philosophy, I think, has changed. But people aren't often clear about this. That's one of the things we'll start being able to talk about next week. There's a kind of anti-realism here, too, of which Barclay is perhaps the first great example. That example says, you know, we can't get to that world. Descartes, in the first meditation, was doing really well. He showed there was a problem. And then he pretended he could solve it. But in fact, all we have are these sensory ideas. We can't have more than sensory ideas. You know what it is to be in a class? You know what it is to be in front of a class? It's to have a certain set of sensory ideas, which are arranged a certain kind of way. And Barclay brings time and says, and if they continue to be arranged a certain way over time, the sensory ideas continue to cohere, that's all there is to being in a class. You don't need something behind the ideas. The class. You take away all the sensory ideas, there's nothing left. So Descartes is the first example of a kind of anti-realism. I think it's a very different kind of anti-realism than we have now in the debates between, say, Dumbin and Wright. But it's a kind of anti-realism. With the anti-realists, so in the Cartesian situation, what, the realist is someone who's going to say, we can get to the far side of the gap. Let me show you how to build the bridge. So realists tend to be in the Cartesian problematic. So Cartesian skepticism here is now just not... When I started out saying Cartesian skepticism, I talked about the skeptic. I was talking about someone who had a certain kind of doubt. But now I'm talking about a whole problematic that comes out of the doubt. And in the Cartesian problematic, the realist is someone who says... We can build a bridge. 
across to the far side of the gap. We can have a kind of reliable knowledge about what's going on over there, even though we're stuck over here. Even though we're stuck inside our mind, we can use that material to bootstrap ourselves to knowledge of the world. The anti-realist in the Cartesian problematic is someone who says, no, the skeptic is right about something. You can't get over there. But it's not so bad. Skeptic makes it sound terrible, or we can't get over there. But the answer is we don't need to go over there. That's a a big nothing. Actually, what knowledge of being in a class is, is a matter of having certain kinds of ideas arranged a certain kind of way. That's enough. So the anti-realist tries to, the realist tries to answer the skeptic by accepting his problem, but saying you can do it. And Descartes himself was an example in that sense of the realist in the Cartesian problematic. In the Cartesian problematic, the anti-realist is someone who says, Well, I agree with you against the realist that we can't get to the far side of the gap, but I don't agree with your conclusion that therefore we can't have knowledge of the appropriate sort, knowledge of whether you're in a class and so forth. You have missed you you have bought into the realist conception of how much we need, and some of that everything I just said will be the same when we look at other kinds of realism and anti-realism, and some of it will be different. We'll have to wait and see. So this is the beginning of a problem. And similarly, I might add, for each of these cases of Cartesian skepticism, and similarly, I might add, next Friday, for each of these cases of non-Cartesian skepticism. We need to get a bit of an overview. Yes? In both those cases, you did maintain the gap between objective conditions and identification of two kind of distributions. Even though he called him an unrealist you assumed the gap in the beginning. Now the, what Barclay says, um, it, I, I'm trying not to get into uh, things that will distract us. I think the very idea of um, truth value distributions already actually presupposes a non Cartesian construal of the problem. <laughs> but I don't argue that right now. We, see, we need to see more. Um, it's already turning into a different way of thinking about the problem. It's not a Cartesian problem anymore, I think. Um, but, um, but what Barclay says is not, Barclay's position is not that there are material substrata and ideas, but we should settle for the ideas because we can't get there. That's not Barclay's position. Barclay's position is that all being a thing is, is having certain ideas. There isn't any more to the idea. Descartes' notion of the external world is a notion of a nothing. Um, Descartes' notion of what reality is, the thing he wants knowledge of outside his mind, cannot be. Derek Berkeley's you know, position can be summed up in two sentences. There are two things, spirits and their ideas. That's a quote. <laughs> um, that's a kind of anti-realism. It's not assuming the gap. It is denying the other side of the gap. In that sense, it is a kind of anti-realism. Um, but it's, 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 very, it's a different kind. Um, I mean, a, a word we might be able to introduce later is phenomenalism. Um, it's a kind of phenomenalism. And in that sense, um, we can see various things that are called anti-realisms that have very different structures as being species of the genus phenomenalism. But, but that's, again, for a few classes from now. Um, I, I'm sorry if I'm frustrating people by not going straight to particular issues, but I think there's a benefit going slowly and making sure we really understand the structure of the issues. Yes? Since you begin with this case, you know, Yes. Since you have this cat, yes. could you how do you know that this is the best case of no? Well, I mean, if you're a skeptic, I mean, you, I mean, what you should say is, you yeah. know, putative best case of knowledge. Best I mean, case. I mean, what, what happens is the person who's putting, putting it forward is not the skeptic, it's the interlocutor. You know, it's someone saying, you know, the skeptic says, there is no such thing as knowledge external. And you say, yes, there is. And then the temptation is to reach for a certain kind of case. And that's when the trouble happens. So the skeptic's not going to say, this is the best case of knowledge, because the skeptic is trying to show you there is nothing which is such a case of knowledge. So, so in that sense, this is mis- misleading terminology. Um, as you'll see in a couple of weeks, again, if when we start talking about this, I think this is a totally problematic description of these cases for a variety of reasons. So I don't, I don't actually 
It's part of why these quotations are marks are here. I don't mean to be buying into this description, but I'm trying to, as it were, capture a certain phenomenology of the philosophical recital. If we try to describe it innocently, in the terms in which it unfolds, if we're just trying to describe Cartesian skepticism without being too critical of it, this appears to be what happens. You don't introduce a bird at 50 feet away. You introduce something that looks like a really good case of knowledge. That's what I meant by best case. Can't think of a better one right now. I could, I'd choose that one instead. And then a ground, then a, ground, a doubt is entered. A ground for knowledge is entered because I can see it. A ground for doubt for that basis is entered. It always has the structure of, but such and such a case is indistinguishable from the one you put forward. In this sense, to borrow a phrase, it always has the general form of an argument of, from illusion. The skeptic, the Cartesian skeptic is always going to say, but you could be in a situation that appears just like that, but it's an illusion. And then it looks like that's what induces the gap. Because then it looks like the illusory case and the real case are indistinguishable. Then it looks like the basis for the knowledge falls short of the thing you want to know. And at that, time, at that moment, the thing you want to know looks like it's on the other side of a gap. In this case, the gap is the mind, and there are different kinds of mental experiences you can have. The experience of dreaming of a certain sort, the experience of being in a classroom, actually being in a classroom and seeing something. And then there's the fact of the matter you want, being in the class. And it looks like the two things are on one side, experiences in the mind. The thing you want to know is outside the mind. And it looks like there's no way from within that you can distinguish the illusory from the vertical case. And then it looks like you have to conclude, I don't know. That's the structure here. So, um, there's two questions that came up earlier I postponed and I want to answer. One was Paul's question about the form. Yeah, what is the form? I haven't really said much about that. And there was your question about, well, what else besides dreaming? <laughs> so, um, let's just get to those two questions now. So, here's, there'll be more to say about the form. I think we're, once, it's easier to really discuss in detail the form of a kind of skepticism when you have more than one example. And you can contrast them and see how they're different. Just like any other two things, if I ask you to describe something, it's helpful. But let's try to say some things about the form right now, even though we only have one case based on what we said. All of the following features will belong to Cartesian skepticism if it's a full-blown case. We start with the best case. So we have a certain kind of example. If choose the example right. A doubt is entered about that case. The doubt is such that it raises a worry that there is a situation that is indistinguishable from our present situation, but wouldn't be a case in which we could claim to know if we were in that situation. Then what happens, another feature of the form we haven't talked about very much, but notice, what you conclude then is not, I guess I don't know I'm in front of a class, like the bird case. Then what you conclude is, I don't know this. Then I never know whether things are as they appear. It's a very important feature of Cartesian skepticism. That you start with an example. It looks like you're talking about the example for a bit. And then the bottom falls out. You have a moment where it's, if I don't know this, I never know. Things of this sort. Descartes doesn't conclude the first meditation by saying, I have shown that when I think I'm in a dressing gown in front of the fireplace, I don't know it. Now let's move on to pants and shirts, and pants and shirts in front of dining tables, and so forth. He, he doesn't need to do that. <laughs> um, so, if I don't know this, I never know. So you go from a particular case to a precipitous general doubt. But it seems like the right conclusion. It's not, one doesn't want to say about the skeptic, oh, he's committed a fallacy. He's concluded from I sometimes know to I never know. It looks like the structure of the example is so basic. If you don't know that, who cares about the bird at 50 feet? Um, um, so that's a further feature of the form. 
I think I'll, I, 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 next class, in the class after, we can start talking about more features of the form. But that's already, if you have those features, you can start, I think, to see what the, what the character of this form is. We'll give you more features. Well, maybe one other feature I'll mention, because it's come up already, is that once you have this doubt that's structured in this way, then you have a gap. That feature is maybe worth mentioning. You have a gap which you need to bridge and you cannot bridge. And I'll even say something else, which may not be very obvious now, but turns out to be quite important. The two sides of the gap always have a certain kind of character. It's a little hard to get this general. But on one side of the gap, we always have the world as, we might say, something like, we want to say now something like, as it is in itself. So, the world described merely physically. We're described as a merely natural set of events or objects. And on the other side of the gap, we always have something that is structured the way the mind is structured. It involves thoughts, intentions, beliefs, appearances, representations, experiences. Things that human subjects can have. Things that could be true or false, or that could be fulfilled or um, um, frustrated to have the structure of, in that sense, expectations or beliefs or wishes or intentions. The two sides of the gap always have that structure. Which side of the gap you're on and which side you're trying to get to, that can change, as we'll see in a moment. But the two sides of the gap always have the feature that there are the way things are and then there's other things we're trying to connect with the way things are that have the structure of a thought or an intention or something a human subject can enjoy. Only a thinking, representing being. In Descartes' language, only a race cogitants could have one of those. And then the question is, how do you connect that bit of race extensa with that bit of race cogitants? That's always the problem, Cartesian skepticism. Whether you have the details of Descartes' ontology or whether you're much more modern and you're talking in terms of quantum mechanics, and some really complicated theory of representation. The problem still has that structure. Um, so that's a further feature of the form. So what the handout does is um, what it's becoming increasingly clear to me that I won't be able to do in class, which is go through all five of these examples. The point of the handout is to show that you have a fairly tight structural analog in these five cases. But let's see how much we can, we can actually do in the class. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in the differences as well as the similarities because it's interesting to see that the differences don't as matter as much as you might have thought. So the next case I want to consider is other mind skepticism. One point of this jump between these two examples is that external world skepticism is, for some people, I think, especially say in literature departments, is archetypal of the most boring and uninteresting. This is the kind of thing philosophers worry about, external. Who cares? You know, you know, a kind of answer is, you know, nobody lives external world skeptics. You can say what you want, but I throw this at always, he'll catch it, you know. Um, but whether somebody really loves me, whether I could know they love me, that's a real, urgent, existential issue. I mean, that's an important kind of skepticism. So one point of this contrast is to take the case that can seem to people like the most philosophically, as it were, disconnected from life. And take the case which, you know, if you read any Shakespeare or Proust or Dostoevsky and have wept a tear reading any of those books, you uh, know something about it. Um, and I'm not saying there are no differences between these cases. I think it's true that this one can grip one, some people perhaps, in the way this one can. And I think there's probably something right about the thought that it's possible to live skepticism of other minds to a degree that it's not clear what it would be to live skepticism about the external world in its Cartesian form. It's very important that the ancient skeptic about the external world, for instance, not doubt the existence of his body, as Descartes does. So. But Cartesian skepticism about the external world, it's not so clear what it would be to doubt it. Um, the line that's when the gap is between mind and world, as it is in Descartes, then it's not so easy to go doubt what's on the other side of the gap. But um, 
for all of those differences, and there are others, I'm not denying them, what I do want to try to show you is these two skeptical problems have the same form, I think, as well as the others we'll look at. And if that's right, if they do have the same form, this is a conditional claim right now, if that's right, then if one is insolvable, I think the other is insolvable. <laughs> and if there's anything like a form of a solution for the one, it ought to at least represent the form of the solution to the other. So um, there's a reason not to simply, as it were, focus one's attention in philosophy too myopically. One's worried about this kind of problem. Especially because a lot has been written about this problem. <laughs> this is the one that people have thought hardest about, for whatever reason. So it's worth noticing how deep its payoffs are if you can figure out who you like on that topic. Um, so how does skepticism about other minds work? Well, now the question is not, how can I know something outside of my mind? But how can I know someone else's mind? How can I know whether Dixon is happy or angry or sad or asleep? <coughs> or can I really know? Um, and so, again, the question here, notice, doesn't have the form of, how can I know what's going on outside of my mind in the world of the body. But the problem here has the form of how can I know what's going on inside someone's body, namely in their mind. So the Cartesian skeptic about perception has got a gap where he's on the mind side. He's trying to get over to the bodily world, the physical world, and know whether things really are as they seem to be in his mind. The skeptic about other minds, if you have a problem about skepticism in other minds, we'll start looking at one, but the shape of it is one in which I have a body. That's not the problem. The body is the thing I'm looking at. The problem is, how can I know what's going on with that person's mind? So, in the first kind of skepticism, the screen, or the veil, is a veil of ideas. In the second kind of skepticism, the veil, or the screen, is the body. The body seems to get in the way. I can see Alois's body, but what is he really thinking? Is he thinking, this is a really boring lecture? Is he thinking really interesting? He, you know, you can't tell from that face. All I can see is the face. I can't, I can't really tell. Um, if the face is in the way, the thought is back there behind it. I can't reach it. So but now I'm looking on, on the body side, trying to get to the mind. So the structure of things on either side of the gap have something similar. But my position with respect to the gap has reversed. That doesn't make it any less cartesian. Um, I'm sorry, you had your hand up a while ago. Well, I want to say that, that the mind outside of my mind is also part of external world. Of mind. So anyhow, very linked to the first problem. Well, sure. If, if you're a skeptic, I'm just saying, here's another problem. Let's start again. Let's look at this problem. I agree. If you're a skeptic about the external world, then you have a problem about whether I have a body, let alone you, there's a body over there. So I agree. You're not going to get to this problem if you have this problem. That's not the point. The point is, let's pick up another philosophical problem somewhere else and look at it. What is the relationship between its structure and the structure of this problem? And, and see how their structure is. The person in the literature department who thinks skepticism about the external world is really boring. Of course there are other people. Of course there are bodies. That's not a problem. That person thinks, ah, oh, but here's a problem. I'm in love with Dixon. I want to know if Dixon loves me. That's a problem. I could never know that. I couldn't know it. I know he tells me he loves me. But, you know, that's what boys his age do. You know, he can't. That's not, you know, that's con every, he could be acting just the way he's acting. And still it could turn out. He doesn't really love me. That person thinks this is a boring problem. That person I'm postulating thinks he has a completely new problem. And all I'm saying is that problem has the same form. I agree with your point. If that person thinks this is a real problem, then 
they're too worried about Dixon's body to go beyond his body. That's one reason why you, you don't really have the problem of their minds in Descartes. You know, but, I mean, it doesn't. There's people try to find it in one sentence, but it's not really a live problem for Descartes. Descartes' meditations are set up around this problem, and if, if you're working this problem, in a sense, it gets in the way of this one. I'm not denying that, but that's that will be true for a number of these things. We'll have a very interesting version of that point that you're making when we look at these two problems and compare them. This problem gets in the way of this problem also. But the point is to notice how philosophers who are, think that that's a really boring area of philosophy, I do the important stuff, are working on problems that have the same form. That's the thing I want to point out now. Um, um, you're right, the guy who works over here will have a particular argument about why his is more important. But then doesn't change my point. <laughs> okay, so now let's, let's get a case of other mind skepticism off the ground. The classic case is the classic case is something like the hand of the envelope of the dressing gown in philosophy of perception. In this kind of skepticism, the classic case is pain. And I think, again, we could ask the question, why pain? In literature, love is the great case, but there's all kinds of reasons why you don't choose love as a classroom case. You know? um, uh, which we won't get into. Um, so pain tends to be the classic case. So let's say um, I think, let's say Richard is um, engaging in spectacular display of pain behavior. He is uh, flailing around, grimacing. His face is writhing with agony. Beads of sweat on his brow. I want to rush to his defense. I say, he's in pain. You're a skeptic about other minds, and a rather immoral one at that. Um, now, uh, what do you say if you want to get me worried about this? What's the structure of what you have? Well, we forgot to answer your other question, didn't we? About dreaming. <laughs> In the other cases. Well, we can talk about that. But there's the bent stick. There's the cardboard cutout, there's the Trump Lloyd painting, there's all sorts of things besides dreams. But the case always is going to be one where if you're in that situation, you can't tell it from the real case. Um, so here again, there's many kinds of scenarios, but um, what, what kind of a thing do I have to say in order to get my claim that I know Richard's in pain? Again, what, why pain? I mean, pain, we need something again that has the structure of a best case. If I said, you know, right now, I think Richard is thinking about his grandmother. I think, you know, I, I've known Richard for a while. And when he gets bored, you know, his thoughts drift to his grandmother, <laughs> who he really misses. She lives way off in northern Norway. Isn't she? If I turn out to be wrong about that, then it's a little bit like the bird at 50 feet. The conclusion is, he wasn't thinking about his grandmother. That's the conclusion. The conclusion is not. We never really know. So the point of somebody flailing around is that it has to be a case of behavior such that if we can't say we know in that case, it can set up the next feature of the form of Cartesian skepticism we're outlining, where this, we can, the skeptic can put us in a position where we can say, if we don't know this, then we never can claim to know what somebody is really thinking, feeling, so. Um, so, he's flailing around in pain. Now, what does the skeptic need? What kind of case does he need in order to overthrow it? He needs a case, yes, where what he's doing is. Just making him feel like he's the first to Exactly. We, we need a, a version of the argument for religion. So he needs to give us a case where now we have to say something like Richard's bodily behavior could be just as it is. The outside. What's going on the outside now? Outside, inside. Still. Uh, what's going on in the outside is just as it appears to me. But on the inside, things are different. Before it was, on the inside, things were the same in both cases. But on the outside, I was in bed in case one, and in the classroom in case two. Here, things on the outside are the same. 
But the inside, case one pain, case two something else. That's the structure of what he has to do. And there are many ways to do this. But the classic way is to say, for instance, Richard is pretending. Or if you like to elaborate the example, Richard is a very good actor. And what's more, he likes to fool professors. Um, if someone is pretending to do X, and he's good at pretending to do X, then again, there are no marks or features that conclusively distinguish a case of someone pretending to be in state X from their being in state X. You might be able to tell, but there isn't any systematic mark or feature such that it is the mark of sincerity any more than there's some mark that an experience bears that is the mark of reality. So just like you can get a really good product that says made in the USA, you know, it's good. You can't look at your experience and go, this one has the mark of reality. There is no mark of reality. And there is no mark of the authenticity of human behavior. Either. Like my argument was, um, uh, but um, if this problem would not exist, art would, would lose a lot of sense because we would never go to sure. you know that. Yeah, I agree. If external that. world skepticism is your problem, <laughs> you don't get to other problems. You're really stuck. <laughs> but, but the point, of course, of the external world skeptic just to be clear about this, the interesting external world skeptic doesn't conclude just that there is no external world. Therefore, blah, 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 as you're saying. The, the external world skeptic's point is you can't know there's an external world. There might well be, but you're, never, you're not in a position to know it. And, and the even more interesting external world skeptic isn't even someone who's drawing a conclusion about something, some large thing called the external world. The interesting external world skeptic, I think, is actually someone who's drawing the following conclusion. For any claim based on sensory knowledge, I'm sorry, any claim based on sensory experience, it never amounts to knowledge. He might agree that 99% of them are true, but no single one of them is a claim to knowledge. And if that's his point, then there's a worry, of, a reason to go into the other thing, because he's not in a sense, doubting existence. Yeah. What he's doubting is your ability to know a claim that turns on a claim about existence. Well, okay. I, I didn't think... Uh, I'm not sure if you understood me. Uh, maybe I wasn't clear. What I want to tell is that what, you, what you're calling the problem is uh, the, the, let's call the dialectical space, as you use the phrase, that gives human relationship meaning. So what you call a problem, I would call the sense of everything. And I, I was uh, claiming that... If, if the problem would not exist, um, uh, uh, things like theater performances would have no sense. Oh well, I agree. But the skeptic, can, the skeptic is not saying that other people don't have feelings. No, no, I, I don't didn't say right. that either. Right, right. I mean, I do think there's a way to push your worry so that it'll turn into the version of the problem of other minds that we'll talk about next class, and then there will be a point to say then theater performances won't exist. But I don't think we're quite there yet. But, but maybe when we have the perspective of some other forms of skepticism, we could come back to this issue. Um, so this kind of skeptic, again, starts with a claim to knowledge. He gives us a best case of knowing what's on someone's mind or in someone's mind. The skeptic raises a question about whether he can distinguish this case from a case that is, if you will, a ringer, a case that's just like this case, but you couldn't tell it apart. It's a bit of American slang. Um, um, if you can't exclude that case, it looks like you can't say you know he's okay. I have no way of excluding the possibility that he's pretending. If I can't exclude the possibility he's pretending or he's acting here, then how can I ever know what's going on in somebody? So, notice, we notice some differences. In the first case, we start with the mind, we know something about the world. In the second case, we start with someone's body, and we want to know about their mind. But notice the similarity in structure. In both cases, there's a claim to knowledge, you enter a best case, a certain kind of problem is posed through a structurally similar example. 
In both cases, it looks like I need an inference to have knowledge. In the one case, I infer from how things appear in my experience to how things are in the world. In the second case, I infer from how things appear to be with you based on your behavior to how things are with you. I want to infer from something to something. In both cases, it looks like the inference is blocked by my not being able to distinguish my basis from an inference from another case that doesn't yield that conclusion, but I can't tell them apart. So I don't know whether I'm in the right situation to infer or not, to detach the consequence. So we have um, all of those similarities. In both cases, then, there's a gap. In both cases, this is why I start with these two, because they have this much in common. There's a transition from mind to body, or inner world to outer world, might be a more precise way to put it. No, in the first case, we start with the inner world. We're trying to get to the outer world. In the second case, we start with a certain neighborhood of the outer world, the human body. The human body here is understood in a certain way. The human body, whether we're a Cartesian or not, we're still understanding the human body in implicitly Cartesian terms in the following sense. We're starting, we're understanding the human body as a certain region of race extensa. That is, the human body is here understood as neutral, psychologically inert matter. You know, it moves around. And then conclusions about people's mental states are inferences based on that. Um, any claim about what someone is thinking or feeling is adding something to what their body is doing. Just like in the first case, we're taking experiences to be ontologically neutral. They merely appear to be of such and such. And then whether things actually are that way is a further fact that blankly obtains over and above the experience. In both cases, there's been a separation of the element that's in the mind from the element that's been in the world. And we need to hook them up. That's the structure of the gap in both cases. And in both cases, the skeptic then says, if you want to structure the gap this way, it looks like there's a problem about getting to the other side. Um, very similar kind of problem. Um, there's other things we could say about the similarities between the problems, but I saved those for later class, so we can just at least peek at some other examples. Let's look at philosophy of language now. Um, here's a form of skepticism about philosophy of language that people in philosophy departments, as far as I can tell, are no longer interested in at all. They're not interested. I'm about to give you a problem with philosophy of language that people in philosophy departments are no longer interested in. They have trouble noticing there's this problem. These two problems I just mentioned, the two Cartesian problems about perception and mind, lots of people in philosophy departments are talking about. There's journal articles. This should have sounded familiar to some of you. But a different kind of skeptical problem has taken over in philosophy language. So people don't notice the one I'm about to discuss. Um, as if it didn't exist. But it's just as possible as a problem. And indeed, I think people in literature departments are worried about it. Um, the problem has to do, again, in this case, the question was, I know how things seem to be. Are they really that way? I understand what the appearance is. But is the appearance truthfully representing the world. I understand that his behavior looks like pain behavior, but is he really in pain? Is his behavior, as it were, accurately representing, act, you know, authentically expressing his inner state? So here we want a problem of that form again. The problem is, I know what this text seems to mean. Or I know what this sign, I think this sign ought to mean. But am I right? Does it really mean that? The way this comes up in literature departments is, you know, you have an interpretation of the text. And someone will say, well, sure, you know, it looks like that's what it means. But how can we be sure that's what Shakespeare really meant? Or how can we be sure that? And there's all kinds of ways to think, get this worry. Some people start worrying about it original editions, some people start worrying about alternative interpretations, some people just say, well, Derrida, 
another interpretation is always possible. So it has the form of the Cartesian worry, but you don't even bother to fill it in. You just say that. Um, but so there's the possibility of the alternative interpretation. You can't exclude the alternative interpretation. So you know, no. so let's take a straightforward example. Let's say there's a sign. Sign said. Let's put an arrow on the sign. Sign like this. Shape like this. And it says. Trondheim. So, I'm in my car. I've always wanted to visit Trondheim. Here there's a wonderful cathedral there. I come to this sign. I turn right. I'm about to turn right. My wife says, you know, I've heard that things are different in Norway. And that Norwegians naturally respond to such a sign by thinking, you should go that way. Um, of course that would mean this. Or a more realistic example is you're in Greece. And you ask somebody, you know, is that the way to Trondheim? And they go like this. And they go, oh, yes, it is. But he's just giving you the Greek gesture for, no. Might have been a little clear if you went like this. But he doesn't do that, unfortunately. He just shakes his head up and down. Um, so there's a gesture or a sign. Seems like a perfectly natural way of interpreting it. And then I say, but, you know, there are occasions in which exactly the same gesture, or exactly the same physical object, or exactly the same uh, string of words, must be a nice example of this across languages, um, um, mean different things. So, the words themselves, the objects themselves, the bodily movement itself needs to be interpreted to be understood. You have the object, but now you need an interpretation. An understanding, again, we have two parts. A physical part, a part that's just in the natural world, an inscription, a bodily movement, a geometrical shape and something the mind has to contribute a grasp, an understanding an interpretation you combine those two things and then you have meaning, you have an understanding of meaning but, the skeptic this is the strategy in this kind of skepticism about meaning can always construct a situation where he says things could be exactly the same as they are here, but the actual, the correct interpretation in this circumstance is different from the one that you otherwise would have, or you have natural. So across two contexts, same sign, same meaning, uh, sorry, same sign, same shape, different meaning. So now how do you know from within your interpretive construction, now the inside, is not the inside of my sensory experience, but it's inside my, if you're Gautamer, you'll say, horizon of interpretation. How can I know? I can't get outside my interpretation. How can I know that I have interpreted the sign correctly? Just one second. Um, so the, mo the case that you get most often about this, now in recent analytic philosophy, but it's usually quickly turn to something else, but if you want to make it a Cartesian case, it, nowadays is the number following case. You have, you know, two, four, six, eight. And then we go to a thousand. And then the question is, what next? Well, a thousand and two seems like a natural thing to say. But this part could be the same. So we have it the same coming in a different way here now, in a more complicated way. But notice the structure is still the same. It's just a more convoluted example for various reasons that are important. So there's a part that's the same, and then there's a continuation. And all you have as your basis is this. And then you need to add something to it to understand this as giving you something that, in this case, means a series. 
But so again, there's many different kinds of examples of this sort of philosophy language. The more naive cases are cases where you just have, you know, something like a gesture or a word, which can be interpreted more than way. It can, as Derrida says, always susceptible of another interpretation. You can get more complicated cases, but they still will have this structure. Yes? Yeah, I don't know. Paul or Laul mentioned it. I think when you take the example of saying was Yes. In, in the ring of the variety of skepticism, I don't think you can exclude the issue of time. Well, why am I excluding it? All I'm saying is, I want to turn right. My wife said, you know, the skeptic says, but well, I understand why you think that, but you could be wrong. And now I want to say, I know I'm supposed to turn right. I know this means that. This, this, I want to say something of the form. This, sorry, this means that. The this is something physically describable as a shape, a set of words, a gesture. The that is something that's semantically articulated and involves correctness and incorrectness in the light of this understanding. I do this rather than that. It's just an object in the world. I don't have to do anything. So a sign post that's trying to drive. There's a correct and an incorrect understanding. So here we just have an object in the world. Here we have something in the light of which I can act correctly or incorrectly. And I want to make a meaning claim. I want to say this object in the world should be understood this way. So this is the correct action in the light of it. This is the incorrect one. This is the correct inference. This is anything. And I want to say something that has the form. I know this means that. And the point is, the skeptic can always say, Give me an example of a this, which so described is exactly like my this. But in the case he gives me, it means something else. And then how am I going to say, but still I know. I know this must mean that. And it looks like if I accept this description of the problem, then I have a problem of the same form that I have here and here. That's the point. You know what I was saying that when you take the example of the Yes. Imagine maybe you stay, I don't know, maybe in Chicago or somewhere and you always drive along the road every mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. And then I say to you going to travel back after two months. Okay. But and you know find the same person in the road. Right. But yes, and you should have listened to the news. <laughs> Yesterday there was a special show and they said, We're changing the rules. From now on, people who drive in the right have to drive in the left. The driver's age limit for driving license is now 21 instead of 18. And the signposts that point this way now mean that way, because there's been some confusion about this. There was this guy, Dixon, who was having trouble wondering about it. So we just made a new rule. It's harder for everyone else, but it's easier for Dixon. You should have watched the news. How are you going to rule? You know, you, you can't get rid of the... If, if, this can mean that in some situation. You're not going to be able to argue by the skeptic just by saying, it's the same point as before, enough quantity of time has passed. All the quantity of time will give you is probability. It's more likely. But the skeptic's not saying, you're, probably you're right. Probably you're in a classroom. Probably he's in pain. I mean, Christ, look at him. Let's call the ambulance. But the skeptic's point isn't, what should we do? Should we call the ambulance? The skeptic's point is, can you claim to know? Now, I'm not saying time might not help here. As I said, I think Kant finds a way to use time to help in the argument against Cartesian skeptic. But I don't think it can just be quantity of time. All quantity of time will give you is probability. And the skeptic's not saying it's unlikely he's in pain. He's saying you can't know because you can't exclude the Ringer case. And time isn't going to give you a way of excluding it, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Well, but well, maybe not. But that doesn't 
doesn't have it. It could be. Right. It might be that no one made this particular gesture while they were in pain and failed to be in pain. Yeah. But that's a hard way to argue against the skeptic. <laughs> um, um, yeah. Um, I chose this example partly for naughty reasons. Um, let me just be honest with you. Um, on Friday, we'll discuss a different kind of skepticism about language in which Wittgenstein uses this example. Wittgenstein's point of this example is something totally different. It's nothing to do with the point I just made. <laughs> I chose this example to make this point just to show, partly when we go to the next point, how easily one can confuse different skeptical issues. So, in a sense, this looks like Wittgenstein's example. It depends what you think an example is. <laughs> but if an example is discussing something for a certain philosophical purpose, then this isn't Wittgenstein's example, actually. But, but I've chosen on purpose precisely because I think you know, what the issue is in philosophy and language gets confused. Um, Wittgenstein's not worrying about a Cartesian issue in philosophy and language, as we'll see next time. So I had a kind of ulterior motive in choosing that example so I could go back to it. Um, um, but I thought I'd better be clear about that in case you think I mean to be explaining Wittgenstein's use of that. I don't. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. I meant to be, in a sense, anticipating his example so I can distinguish it. Um, there's much more to say about this um, philosophy language case, but I think what I'll do in my last few minutes is at least just mention these cases quickly so we have a further so we can start saying no this can keep happening over and over again we can have various forms of Cartesian skepticism Cartesian skepticism is not forced or is not somehow a product of directing your doubt at a particular philosophical topic the external world other minds meaning you can get it over and over again Cartesian skepticism is a form of philosophical worry which you can get going in any area of philosophy. I would even claim that um, it's a constitutive of something's being an area of philosophy, that the different forms of skepticism, of which this is one, can be motivated in them. That's sort of a sign that, you're, that the answers you're giving are answers to philosophical questions. But that's a big claim. I won't try to defend that right now. Um, so the problem of intentional action... Um, Again, the trick here is to dis this problem can turn into the problem of other minds if we don't describe it carefully. There's a different problem here. The problem of other minds is I have no doubt at all that um, Richard is you know, expressing pain here. If I think he's pretending to be in pain, there's a sense in which I'm not doubting that the behavior signifies pain. My worry there is, is he really in pain? What's his state? Um, he can only pretend to be in pain if he knows what pain behavior is. So, you know, having criteria for pain behavior won't help me because they'll apply to someone who's pretending. Otherwise, you couldn't understand the play on the stage. Um, um, that's not our problem here. Our problem here is not distinguishing whether a certain mental state obtains, the pain itself, behind the behavior. Here what we want to know is whether behavior is expressive of agency. So I mean a simple kind of example would be if someone raises their hand. You know, Michael has been demonstrating this for several times. He's very good at that. But say suddenly Michael develops a condition in his arm. His hand goes up. Looks just like it did before. And I say, yes, next question. And he says, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm working on this. Um, Peter Sellers is famous for making some gesture like this famous in one of his movies. Um, so we have the case of this or this, unobstructed. And we want to know, so we have a, a gesture, a human action. I mean, that's a case of a human action. There are all kinds of other human actions. Um, you know, falling would be an interesting case to think about. You can let yourself fall. Um, I say, you know, this is a very good thing to practice. Put down a carpet. You know, there's certain kind of wacky people in California who think you can really turn yourself into a better person by doing things like this. Put down a very soft carpet and everything. And then close your eyes. And just, yes, you're afraid. You have to overcome your fears. So let yourself fall. Um, and then there's the case of somebody like me who just falls. Because um, I'm a philosophy professor. And that's what we do sometimes. So, What's the difference between the person who can just let themselves fall? Just like that. They've gotten really good at it. 
that practice that they've reached level seven spiritually, where they go down like a rock, without even apparently needing to think about it first. And the klutz who goes down like a rock, because he's a klutz. Or the arm goes up. So the body does the same thing. You can make up your own example. But in one case, the person was acting. He was an agent. He intended to do it. It was a voluntary action, we say. It was expressive of his will. We have all kinds of ways of talking about this. And in order to be a human being, we might say things like, you must have a will. You must be able to form intentions and act on them. This thing can fall too, if I let go of it. But it can never intend to fall. It can raise its parts. You know, and sometimes if you have a bad cell phone, it just does for no reason. But it never intends to, I claim, about cell phones. Um, you get to computers, we might get into more trouble. Um, now, um, what's the difference? You can have a certain kind of skeptical say, you can never know that something's intentional, actually, let alone know what the intention is. You know, most, they're not the skeptic again, if we're clear about him, we want to make him interesting, make his position the philosophically most important, strongest one. Isn't doubting for the moment that most human behavior is action on acting on intentions. But what they are claiming is it could be mere physiological causes, or it could be mere unconscious psychological drives, like Peter Sellers, you know, deep and abiding obsession with a Fuhrer, which means even though he doesn't want to raise his hand, he does. Whatever causal story you want to tell. But the cause of the action could be something beyond the agent's control. In both cases, you have something that happens in the world that's describable, an action. Part of the premise of Cartesian skepticism here, a very attractive premise, it seems, is, well, the action is exactly the same, whether it's intended or not. One of the reasons I think that makes this premise particularly attractive in this case, which is why it's a useful case to look at, is because now they are temporally dislocated. In the case of the pain, our tendency is to think of the pain as behind the pain behavior, accompanying it at the same time. If you want to get really physiologically technical, you know, the pain is probably a second before the arm shoots out. But when we talk about it in philosophy, we tend to think the pain is happening now, behind. But the intention, you know, if I, um, uh, you know, if I do something, if I can form the intention, well in advance of my doing it. And always, at any rate, some point in advance. We don't think of, or the, the philosophical picture that Cartesian has here, is not one where the intention accompanies the action, but there's the intention and then there's the action. So the gap here is not just a physical gap, uh, and it's not just a gap between the physical and the mental, but it's also a gap between something mental at one point in time in something physical at another point in time. And so now it seems like, how could you get the intention? What's happening now is the same bodily behavior. And the thing you want isn't even here now. It, it was back there. And how can you tell if that's the cause or if something else is the cause? Probably, you know, usually, if he raises his hand, he means to raise it. But how could you know that? So again, we have this form of Cartesian skepticism. These, I mention this because these problems in the philosophy of action, this is a huge area in analytic philosophy right now. There's much research on bodily moment, mental causation. Is this possible? It's a completely self-enclosed industry, like so often happens in analytic philosophy. I think these problems are exactly the same form as these problems. As if you set it up so that the skeptical argument from illusion seems to control your description of the intention. The intention is utterly external to the action. Then you're either going to have a kind of realism about intention, which is going to look very vulnerable, because how could you ever really have access or know these intentions? They look like extremely slender posits um, that never really suffice to explain the phenomena, and they seem to compete with other explanations. 
movement that seemed by our explanatory standards to do better. Or you become a kind of anti-realist. And you're going to say, well, all the intention is. But the dialectic is exactly the same as here. Uh, did you discuss the art example? It's on the handout if you want to look at it. But again, I think you can get an issue that looks. I purposely, again, chose these two to get areas of philosophy where, as far as I can tell, the literature is completely insulated from these issues. But I think the issues have very similar structure. At least I don't see why the issue is not similar. I'd be interested to see if you can see it. So look through the handout, especially with the examples we did more carefully. I'd appreciate if you could try actually working through them yourself in the shower or the bathroom or while you're walking down the street. In a sense, you don't need much reading. You, know, you just start with a butt or a sign or a putative work of art. And just see if you can generate a Cartesian skeptical problem out of um, for these examples. And then next time, we'll talk about a different kind of skepticism. And as time allows, we'll start to compare them. The end of next time and going on to Monday.